What is it that you are alleging the May Day PAC run by Lawrence Lessig and others to have done? Well, pure and simple, they violated the disclosure laws that they say they support. Uh, when they ran this $1.6 million campaign in favor of a candidate in New Hampshire uh, who lost, got 23% of the vote, uh, they ran a lot of TV and radio ads and a lot of the ads didn't have the proper disclaimers as required by the law. Now, we think a lot of these laws are stupid and unconstitutional, and we'd like to see a court strike them down someday. But until they do, the law is the law. And Mayday PAC, you know, I think has been a huge hypocrite in this whole process. They say they favor more of these laws, yet they didn't follow the laws. So either they're a hypocrite or they just didn't understand it. And if they didn't understand it, that's what's really interesting because the group was started by a Harvard Law professor who's the, also the director of a major center on ethics. And here he's running perhaps as much as, well, certainly over $300,000 in advertisements, and they didn't get the law right. I think that says something. Either the law is too complicated for him or they ignored it. All right. So uh, what would you suggest as a remedy for uh, specifically the kinds of problems that this uh, Harvard Law professor, among other uh, big right. super PACs and smaller super PACs, have to comply with? Well, the remedy is we got to get rid of a lot of these disclaimer laws. Uh, the, gov the, the Congress actually passed a law that requires you to say a bunch of gibberish. I mean, just to take one example, in a radio ad, you have to say something. Here's a, I'm, I, I think I'm going to get this right to tell you what the disclaimer should be. Made it, paid for by Made a Pack. Okay, I think everyone gets that. That's fine. But then the disclaimer law requires you to also say, Made a Pack is responsible for the content of this advertising. Well, isn't that pretty much paid for by Mayday Pack? I mean, if you paid for it, aren't you responsible for the content of the advertising? And if you said content of this ad, that's illegal too because it, I guess it doesn't have enough syllables in it. Instead of saying advertising, it says ad. But that's not all. Wait, there's more. Then you have to say not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee, and then you have to give your physical address, phone number, or website URL. Now, in this day and age of the internet, you don't need a URL to find a group. You could just Google um, a group's name and it's probably going to come up in the first result. So we have radio ads where about 12 seconds of a radio ad is now turned over to government mandated gibberish instead of saying things you want to say about a candidate. And we think that's a ridiculous situation, especially when a lot of radio ads are 20 seconds, 30 seconds, even 15 seconds long. Uh, Lawrence Lessig, in response, has said every Mayday.us ad fully identified Mayday.us as its sponsor, and unlike super PACs that accept dark money, Mayday.us, which is also its website, I assume, uh, discloses every contribution, in parentheses, over $200 as well. None could be confused about whom this ad was from, and anyone who cared could identify whom the PAC was funded by. Great. Well, I mean, he's not addressing the complaint, which is they didn't follow the law. And the, a number of the commissioners on the Federal Election Commission, especially the Democrats, have specifically defended uh, these types of disclaimers, the website listing, the fact that the group is not, uh, uh, the ads by the group is not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. The May Day PAC never said that in any of their radio ads. Again, I think a lot of these laws are, are silly. Um, I would have been greatly heartened if May Day PAC said, wow, the Center for Competitive Politics really has it right here. These disclaimer laws are silly. We need to simplify them so anyone can figure them out. And we don't need to mandate a bureaucratic sounding phrase to make an ad legal or illegal. And complicated compliance laws for these kinds of uh, electoral speech, these are typically going to be uh, volumes of speech that go out over the course of a campaign, 
uh, groups come in and out of existence because they're expressly for the purpose of doing this kind of advocacy, it seems to uh, set a bar for participation in this kind of advocacy that sort of rules out smaller groups that might want to uh, might want to do it without hiring a lawyer. Right. Well, it's very intimidating. Um, a lot of campaigns are not terribly well funded. A lot of the congressional races, especially these races in non-competitive districts, people are just running to give the voters a choice. They don't like the idea of a candidate being on a ballot unopposed. And a lot of groups just feel strongly about something. I mean, look a lot of the Tea Party groups, for example. A lot of the, um, the, um, you know, the liberal groups that sprung up after the, you know, the bank bailouts and stuff. You know, Occupy Wall Street. These were not terribly well-funded groups. The idea that these groups are going to be able to hire a lawyer and figure out what they, you know, what filings to make, what disclaimers to put in their ads, and so on. You know, I think a lot of groups just look at it, hear about it, and say, wow, I don't need that hassle. I'll just do something else. But here we have a group run by a Harvard Law professor that has $10 million, whose board of directors is a who's who in the movement to put more regulations on speech, and they basically messed up on all the radio ads that they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on, I think it's appalling. I mean, it shows either how complicated the law is or they think the law doesn't apply to them because the law only applies to evil, you know, corporate funded um, groups like the Chamber of Commerce or something. So I don't know which it is, but, you know, my hope is that Mayday PAC will join our call for, hey, let's simplify the campaign finance laws. We don't need a lot of the laws that we have now, and we ought to have exemptions in the laws for small groups. I mean, the idea right now, if you form a small group, as soon as you hit $1,000 of spending, you have to start filing reports to the Federal Election Commission. That's crazy. What congressional race in the country is going to turn on a $1,000 expenditure? The answer is none of them. So there ought to be much larger exemptions before you have to file $25,000, $50,000, something like that. CNN is reporting that uh, some group or a group of groups or people were communicating using uh, Twitter accounts that telegraphed essentially polling data to uh, on a public publicly available uh, Twitter account. And the question that's being raised is is does that rise to the level of coordination that between, candidates and candidate committees and super PACs? Well, I would say a definite maybe. Um, you know, we don't know en enough about it. We just have the CNN story. Uh, if it is, it's not so much coordination because that is something where you're coordinating a, an advertisement or a message. You're getting the approval of a party committee or a candidate about the contents of the ad. Nevertheless, you're not allowed to give in-kind contributions to party committees or candidates without reporting those contributions, and those contributions are subject to contribution limits, um, which to me is the real source of a lot of the complexity in the campaign finance laws. When you have contribution limits, then you have to come up with all kinds of other rules to make sure that other things that might help a campaign um, are somehow limited. So the campaign, uh, as we talked about beforehand, of Allison Lundergan Grimes in Kentucky received below market rental rates on some transportation. Right. And it's so it's not clear exactly, well, what kind of discount was that? What's the market rate? How much would they have had to pay at right. this time for this thing? Right. There are all kinds of rules in the Federal Election Commission's regulations about uh, charging for various services, and it has to be a fair market value. And a lot of the people that looked at the bus contract, who also had bus companies, said, we don't know anyone that lets buses go for that amount. Now, I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about the fair market value for buses in Kentucky, but it shows part of the complexity in the laws is you have to look at things like that and then report it and so on and so forth. But the fact that it was reported in the first place enabled people to say, Wow, that that total they're paying for that bus doesn't quite look right. So in polling data, uh, that information 
just the, as, as uh, CNN reports, Chris Moody, former Catoite, uh, in fact, at CNN reports, uh, a lot of this had districts, states, and top line numbers. If you didn't know what each of those numbers meant, you'd, it would look like gibberish, essentially. Mm -hmm. But uh, that can be quite expensive. Right. Well, running a poll, I mean, you know, a, a poll can easily cost ten to 20000 or even more dollars. And so, obviously, if you were to give a party committee or a candidate the results of a poll, that could be very valuable to the the campaign, especially a party committee. A party committee has to decide, look, we've got limited resources. Where are we going to place those limited resources with ads in the closing weeks, you know, months before the election? And if they don't have to pay for polling to give them reports on the districts that might be competitive out there, then they can make better decisions about where to place their money. When you talk about in-kind contributions, the, the number one example that I uh, think of is Oprah Winfrey appearing on behalf of Barack Obama right. in Iowa right. in 2007, 2008. Right. Her mere presence at an event on behalf of a candidate has enormous in-kind value, far in excess right. of uh, she as just a normal person. She's Oprah. Right. Well, a lot of political scientists think that endorsement, I think I think one of them put a, tried to put a value on it and I think said $10 million. I'm not sure that number's right or if I'm remembering it right. But there's been a lot of analysis that uh, where political scientists have concluded that she tipped the Democratic primary nomination away from Hillary Clinton and toward Barack Obama. And Volunteer activity by entertainers, whether it's a benefit concert or an endorsement, that's exempt under the contributions, uh, and, and it, is as it, it should and, be. Is it because this is somebody doing what they do and the fact that they have a certain amount of notoriety, we don't treat that as a relevant fact for campaign finance laws? I'm not going to defend it because, sure. I mean, I think it's, I think it's fine. I just don't think it's fair that, you know, someone as famous as Oprah can give the equivalent of $10 million to a candidate, and Oprah has a huge corporate empire on her own, right? So if the, if the justification for contribution limits is to limit influence, which the court hasn't said is good enough, but to limit corruption or its appearance, then why do you have someone like Oprah, who's overseeing a big corporate empire on her own, she can give ten million dollars because she's worth that. It's some some guy who works making you know piping somewhere in Peoria, Illinois, can't give more than twenty six hundred dollars. I mean, to me, that doesn't make any sense. So a lot of this is very complicated. What is the fix, both for I guess obviating the desire for either super PACs or in this case possibly the NRCC or some related group from feeling the need to hide in plain sight telegraphing this kind of information to essentially very specific people? Well, I, I think it's clear. You take off the contribution limits and you let, you let the candidates and parties accept it, report it, and the voters can decide, you know, do we want to elect a candidate who's getting contributions from these donors or not? And if the voters are, don't like that idea, they can vote for the other candidate. And if you do that, I think a lot of candidates will self-limit. They'll decide they're not going to take a contribution over whatever the amount is that they think political, politically saleable in their district or state. So, you know, and but by doing this, you get rid of a huge amount of complexity in the campaign finance laws. And actually, a number of states are doing this already. About half the states in the country have no contribution limits on political parties. Um, about 12 have no contribution limits to candidates. And these states, some of them are among the best run stand, uh, states in the country. There's no evidence these states have higher levels of corruption, no evidence that people think their governments are less honest. So the reality is the contribution limits don't seem to do any good at all. Do you think super PACs go away when we get rid of contribution limits? They won't go away completely, but they'll shrivel. Um, the reason why they won't go away is there are going to be some causes that people want to push that candidates aren't going to want to talk about. So 
you know, maybe 10 years ago, it would have been gay rights. Maybe right now it's drug policy. It could be immigration. There's lots of issues where the candidates don't necessarily want to talk about. And in the future, they won't have to be Ross Perot in order to get those issues on the table. Right. But people may want to put money, pool their money in a super PAC and try to force discussion on that issue. So I think you'll always see a role for super PAC. But if you don't have contribution limits, most people that want to back the candidate will give the money directly to the candidate or their party. And the people that are really motivated about some issue they want as part of the national discussion will give their money to a you know, super PAC or you know, to some kind of group. Thank you.